Good morning. Uh, the reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 26. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. My name is David Anderson, and as many of you know, I'm the Calling 21 intern here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church. For the past month and a half or so, I've been able to live among you and learn with you and grow with you. And so for this sermon, I want to give a part of myself back to you. And for some, that may look like a call story, but it didn't quite feel right for me. And so I want to share with you a core part of my Christian walk, something that over the past few months has helped me and shaped me and let me dive deeper into my faith than ever before. And that's something is spiritual intentionality. That is living purposefully and deliberately as an intentional Christian. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here together today. Thank you for letting us worship you. Thank you for the ways you work, seen and unseen. Please let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. O oh Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So what does an intentional Christian look like? And to explore this, I want to take another look at today's scripture. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to receive a crown that will not last, but we do it to receive a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. 1 Corinthians is not the only time in the New Testament that writers used athletics as a means of illustrating the Christian walk. Athletic metaphors such as running the good race appear in Hebrews, Philippians, Galatians, and 2 Timothy. And the question then arises, what about an athlete's life captured New Testament writers' attention? Why athletics? And to that, I say that athletes are intentional. Take, for example, the career of Iliad Kipchoge. He is a Kenyan long-distance runner and winner of the gold medal in the marathon in the 2016 Rio Olympics. When interviewed, he described his weekly training schedule, which consisted of 130 miles per week. And to put that in perspective, that is an average of 18 miles run every single day. His training partner described his daily diligence and said he is always the most disciplined. He tells me to be a smart athlete, to follow the advice of my coach, and to focus on training. And that right there is why I believed, why I believe New Testament writers were fascinated with athletics. What if we applied that advice to our spiritual lives? I'll read it again. He is always the most disciplined. He tells me to be a smart athlete, to follow the advice of my coach, and to focus on training. When asked about his diet, Iliad said that maintaining a ravenous hunger is not only helpful, but it is a fundamental requirement. And again, imagine what that would look like in our spiritual lives, maintaining a ravenous hunger as a fundamental requirement. The words of Jesus Christ, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
When he was asked about winning the gold medal in the 2016 Olympics in Brazil, Iliad stated, I absolutely want one of those. It is the only one I lack in my career. It means more than everything. Iliad knew how to run in such a way as to get the prize, but what prize was he running for? When I worked at Camp Overlook last summer, we talked about this exact thing. Our theme was prayer, and we tied that in to the Olympics going on at the time. We talked about how Olympians spend hundreds and hundreds of hours for a chance to achieve their goals. Some of them sacrifice jobs, relationships, and education, and they do all this for what? What prize are they running for? For a gold medal tied around their neck. And if these men and women can display such intentionality for a piece of metal tied around their neck, how much more should we as Christians be displaying for our prize? They do it to achieve a crown that will not last. We do it to achieve a crown that will last forever. Athletes often talk about self-control. It's an essential part of training and being an athlete. And Paul writes about this as well. But too often we think of self-control just as restraint. That is, I have self-control because I'm not eating this cupcake, which looks oh so good. Or I have self-control because I'm not yelling at this person who I'm so incredibly mad at. And restraint is a part of it. But we can also turn it around and say that self-control involves action, deliberate action. That is, I have self-control because I did wake up and run 18 miles per day. I have self-control because I did wake up and intentionally spend time with God. This is where the strict training that Paul talks about comes into play, and this is where my life started to change like it never had before. Last year at William & Mary, I was in a men's small group, and the leader was a senior at the college named Joshua Kim. And he was one of those men that just exudes godliness and wisdom. His heart was in the right place, and it felt natural just to sit next to him and learn from him and soak in what he was saying. He made a deliberate effort to meet with each of us in the small group privately over the course of the semester to talk about our Christian walks. And when he met with me, we had dinner, and he started asking me some questions. And eventually, he looked at me and said, David, do you set aside time each day for God? And I thought about it. And I couldn't point to a specific time in the day, so I tried to give a half answer and say, well, sometimes when I go on runs, I can also think about God or what. And he interrupted me and said, no, do you intentionally set aside time each day for prayer and reading of the scripture? And I said, no, I don't. He said, you need to. Now, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way at first. <laughs> no one likes to be corrected so overtly, and so I kind of grumbled about it myself over the next week. But in the back of my mind, I knew he was right. You see, I was letting my faith sit and expecting something to happen. I was not being intentional. I wasn't running in such a way as to get the prize. Any tree, any plant, no matter how fruitful, no matter how good the soil is, will begin to wither if you do not water it. And so I did start to read scripture. I did start to pray. And my life began to noticeably change. Now, I need to say daily reading and prayer are not the only means to grow, but these two disciplines, and yes, I do use the word disciplines, have changed my life in ways that I could never have imagined. And so I want to dive a bit deeper into both of them. And first, I do believe that intentional reading of the scripture is a vital part of our Christian walks. A pastor named Burke Parsons once said, so many are looking for special revelation from God, 
while it sits on their shelves gathering dust. When I heard that quote, it hit me pretty hard, but it's true. It gets to the very idea of what Scripture is, and it is the revealed Word of God to us. It is God's grand plan of salvation. It is the greatest love story ever told because it talks about the greatest and most unfathomable expression of love ever shown. And for our purposes of running the good race, it is a roadmap. It is a roadmap to Christian living, and it is a roadmap to the very race we're trying to run. So why do we need to read it? Because it is God's word. Because it does tell us how to live. And it brings us closer to God, and by being closer to God, we have a better understanding of God's will. So we do not run aimlessly. We do not fight like a boxer beating the air. With it, we have direction, we have a path, we have a goal. And it also centers us. Imagine your day starting out differently instead of the morning rush of coffee and traffic and work. Imagine starting with silence in God's word. Through daily reading, we have the opportunity to renew ourselves each and every day so that we may better reflect Christ in the ways we act, in the ways we think, in the ways we talk, and through that, we change our lives. Through that, we change our houses, our families. Through that, we change our workplaces. Through that, we change the world. The second of the two disciplines I wanted to talk about that have changed my life is that of intentional prayer. But the two are not standalone. They are not separated. They are closely related, intimately related, because by reading the Bible, we understand the need, the critical need for intentional prayer in the life of a Christian. Romans 12.12 12 says, be faithful in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And finally, the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 7, 7, ask, and it shall be given. But understanding the need for prayer is a lot different than understanding how to pray or what to pray. And that's a stumbling block. It was a stumbling block for me and many people I knew and the first thing I have to say is that I realized the need when praying to know that God is present, to know that God is with you as you are praying. James 1.6 says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Even so, for a long time, I did not pray because I felt uncomfortable doing it. So when we tried to teach the kids at Camp Overlook how to pray, it was difficult because they felt uncomfortable, and also some of the staff felt uncomfortable. So how do we get more comfortable at something? By doing it. How do we get comfortable with running 18 miles per day? By starting with one mile per day. By doing it. How do we get more comfortable with prayer? By praying. Just as an athlete goes into strict training, so must we. My oldest brother, Eric, is here this morning, and he's really into strength training. In the strength training world, there's these countless debates about how many times you're supposed to perform a lift or how many rep sets of that lift you're supposed to perform, how that relates to the weight you need versus your goals versus what you're trying to do, all these different things, and people get caught so much in talking about it and debating it, and they don't get caught up in doing it. And so he talked to me about this idea of spending time under the bar. It's as simple as that, regardless of any of that. Just the simple action of spending time under that bar means you are getting more comfortable doing it. And the same goes for prayer. Spending time under that bar, praying, the action of praying means that you are getting more and more comfortable with it. And as I started to set aside time each day to pray, it did start to become more comfortable. 
And as I continued to set aside time each day to pray, it started to become necessary. At first, it was a forced part of my day. At first, I felt uncomfortable doing it, but it eventually felt uncomfortable going a day without it, and it eventually became one of the best parts of my day. This awe still doesn't help us, though, when we ask, what do we pray? What on earth do we pray? Where do we start? And again, I want to point to the relationship, the close relationship between prayer and reading of the scriptures, because the disciples had that exact same question. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he did. And that prayer that we pray every Sunday, that Lord's Prayer, is an excellent place to start because it was taught to us by Jesus Christ, God incarnate. And that prayer is not limited to the sanctuary. Another place that I've found is helpful is the book of Psalms. And I believe that the book of Psalms is one of the most well-known books of the Bible, but I also think it's one of the most undervalued books of the Bible, especially for one who's searching and trying to learn how to pray and what to pray, because that's all the book is, songs to be offered to God, prayers to be offered to God, prayers of sorrow, joy, confession, thanksgiving, praise, instruction, despair, hope, and more. And so if anyone ever asked me, what do I pray, where do I start, I would without hesitation point them to the book of Psalms. I would point them to 150 of the most beautiful prayers ever written. I would tell them to open it up and to read them and to pray them and to delight in them. And a final piece of advice that has helped me immeasurably with this, with this getting comfortable with praying, is the idea of praying in concentric circles. Now, I learned this from a theologian named John Piper, and he said to do this, you start in the middle. You start with yourself and your needs, your need for discernment, thanksgiving, confession, help, praise, anything you need, you pray. And then you move a step out. And you pray for your spouse. You pray for your parents, for your children, those closest and dearest to you. And you move a step out and you pray for your friends, your colleagues, your peers, those in need that you know. You move a step out and you pray for the church, for this specific church, Braddock Street United Methodist Church, that what we're doing and where we're going is pleasing to God. From there you move out to the United Methodist Church. From there you move out the nation, out, out, etc. But to do this, you have to pray for every person and everything by name. And again, it's that idea of spending time under the bar because while it may take a while to pray for everything and everyone that is close to you that matters in your life, that means it's taking a long time in the presence of God. That means you're spending more and more time under that bar and you're getting more and more comfortable in prayer. And again, this concentric circle method of praying is not the hard and fast rule, and it may not be for everyone, but it has helped me in ways that I could never imagine. It has helped me get to where I am today. And so I did want to share it with you. These disciplines of daily reading and daily prayer are not the only means of growing, but they are an excellent starting point because from them, we realize our other needs in our Christian walks. We realize the need to gather together in a space like this and worship. We realize the need to come together in small groups and develop and grow as disciples in Christ. We realize the need to take ourselves out of our comfort zone into the community, into Winchester and help others. We realize the need for mission and ministry in our communities. And so the intentional doing of these things, prayer, reading, worship, small group, mission, and others, the intentional doing of these things is not only the strict training needed to run the race, but it is part of the race itself. And so when you're doing these things, you're not only training, you're not only growing 
in Christ, you are doing, you are running the race, you are moving forward, you are progressing as a person and as a Christian. This internship is called Calling 21 because it is meant for young adults like me and five of my peers throughout Virginia to explore our callings in the 21st century, a new way of doing church. How are we going to respond to the needs of the world? How is the body of Christ? Are we going to respond? And we explore our callings and where we fit into that. But one thing I have learned, callings are not restricted to interns. (laughs) Callings are not restricted to pastors. Each and every one of us has a calling. And it is the same calling expressed in numerous, infinite different ways. It's the same calling, but it can be summarized in three words from Jesus. Come, follow me. But for every call, there does have to be a response. So I urge all of us to be intentional in that response because when we say, yes, Lord, lead me and I will follow, that's not the end of it. (laughs) It means our training and our race has only just begun. I want to thank every one of you. I want to thank Braddock Street, United Methodist Church, for everything you've done, for everything you've done for me over the past month and a half, and helping me grow and explore my calling and experience God's work in this community. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for everything you do to help each other grow because that's part of what church is about. I want to thank you for everything you do in the community to spread God's kingdom here in Winchester and helping those in need. I want to thank you for all of these things. So, thank you. Will you join me in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us. Thank you again for letting us gather here and worship you. Please help us on our walks. Be our coach. Be our guide. Help us in our strict training. Help us run the race. Help us be intentional. We pray for Dick Harmison, Candy Gardner, Jason Hutchins, Russell Reinhardt, Ginny Cron, Jim Fett, Mark Hilty, Willis Belford, Laureen Belford, Chris Reinhardt, the family of Ken West, Frank Shader, Jimmy the family of Jimmy Carroll, Larry Strite, George Quarles, Harold Madigan, George Morris, Suzanne Brennan, Kelly Robinson, for those in our community who are looking for jobs, for those in our community who are looking for food, for those in our community who are looking for somebody to love them, we pray for them. We also pray that you will use us to reach out to them. We pray for our troops. We also pray that this world will listen to your call of peace and that we may work towards that peace. Again, help us be intentional. And hear us now as we pray that prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed 